Hi, I'm Michael Marin, President and CEO of Holy Name Medical Center. At Holy Name, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support important health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the PNC Foundation, which supports early childhood education through Grow Up Great, a multi-year initiative to help prepare children from birth to age five for success in school and life. The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The New Jersey Education Association. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. The North Ward Center. And by Georgian Court University. Promotional support provided by AM970 The Answer. And by Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Welcome. I'm Steve Adubato. It is my pleasure to introduce for the first time joining us Lauren Meehan, Director of Newark Arts Education Roundtable, which is... Yeah. No, I'm asking. Yes, I'm curious. Yes, which is. No, that's a great <laughs> question. So we are a collective impact initiative, which is basically a fancy way of saying when you have a really big problem, you need a lot of people to help you solve it. So what instead kind of problems of, are we talking about? So we're talking <clears throat> about access to arts education. Um, in the city of Newark specifically, we're place-based, so we focus exclusively on the public schools, the charter schools, and the parochial schools within the city of Newark. What kind of barriers are we talking about for the children and young people in the city of Newark to get the kind of arts education they need? So it's a host of different challenges. Um, one is reduced funding. That's been a, a really critical piece, especially in the last 10 years uh, post-recession. Uh, there's less spending in a lot of communities around arts education. Um, different uh, teacher evaluation systems that are really test-based. So a lot of time, classroom time, that would have been spent on arts education um, has gone to testing. Um, and so prioritizing it and finding the resources for it have been a challenge, but our work in the last 10 years has definitely made an impact. Um, the district has hired a really phenomenal um, arts lead, Margaret L., um, and the new administration there um, under Roger Leon has been really supportive the of our work as well, too. Yes, has <clears throat> been really uh, supportive. Let me ask you, you've been playing the violin since you're eight years old. Yes. <laughs> what got you into, how did you get into playing the violin at such a young age? So um, my public school, actually. No um, kidding. Yes, I went to the West Orange Public through the West Orange Public Schools, um, and so I had great general music through the third grade, and then they sort of had this conversation with us. The band teacher would come in, the orchestra teacher would come in, they'd show you all the different instruments, and then you'd pick. And I actually didn't choose the violin initially; I chose the flute. Um, but there were too many flutes in the band <laughs> section, <laughs> um, and because I have. Um, really good intonation, which is really important for a stringed instrument. Um, uh, my music teacher, my general music teacher, recommended that I actually take up the violin. Um, as my parents can attest, um, playing a stringed instrument sounds very much like someone strangling a cat initially <laughs> <laughs> till you get good at it. Um, and so they were grateful when they finally heard Hot Cross Buns. <laughs> no, it's interesting. You, you are going to be part of a larger forum that we're having on arts education. Mm -hmm. There are two initiatives. One is the uh, Grow Up Great initiative with PNC. The other initiative that, that we're a part of is an initiative called Right From the Start NJ. You'll see the website up as well as we're talking. It's about infants and toddlers mm -hmm. growing up great and becoming the best they can be. Absolutely. What does that have to do with, I mean, talk about yes. infants and toddlers. Right? Okay, so. Um, arts education. Yeah. Music education. There's actually um, a big push and a big initiative now through um, an organization called Cool Cat. Cool Cat. Um, yes, you can find a link to their website on ours. Um, it's coolcatnork.org, uh, I believe. And uh, their work is exclusively around this, how to help parents and preschool programs access high-quality arts education programming. Um, it's also incentivized, so it's also a way to get parents more engaged um, in activities that are going on in their local community. So it might be something that the museum has run for years or sure. the symphony has run for years, but is deepening its engagement through this incentivized program to encourage parents to bring their toddlers and preschoolers to programs. In fact, I think you're talking to Larry Tambori later today. Yeah, Larry's School of the us. Arts. They're right. one of our partner organizations. They're one of our members. Um, and they have a phenomenal um, preschool and toddler program as well. I'm curious about something. What do you think, what is your sense and what does the research show? Mm -hmm 
that for children who are exposed to music, to arts education at a very early age, what do you think it does for them in terms of their development? So there's a lot of um, good data, which you can also find on our website, which is newarkartsout.org. Can we put that up, the, uh, the website? Go ahead. Um, and you can find really good resources specifically around early childhood education. So there are two studies that have taken place um, in the last few years that show the strong social-emotional impact. So kids are more um, socially and emotionally um, intuitive uh, when they've been exposed to creative learning at a very early age. Um, it also tends that those students are better problem solvers. They're good critical really? thinkers. Because? They're good team players. Because I interrupted team yes, players as no, well. It's okay. Yeah, team players as well. And so it really helps um, young children. And this is all the way through the pipeline. It's not exclusive to preschoolers. But obviously, the longer you have these exposures, the more impact they're going to have over your lifetime. Um, but the focus, the drive to, to learn to participate in that activity, um, working with an ensemble, right? So you're creating the sound as a community often, especially in the preschool space, whether it's a song together or drumming or some kind of exercise that you're doing what as a community. Confidence? Definitely confidence. builds confidence. Um, you know, we do some work now with uh, VH1 Save the Music Foundation, who has come to Newark to invest in um, the music program in the public schools. And one of the things we noted from some of the initial feedback from those students is the confidence. Um, they felt like they weren't good in school. There were mm. things they weren't good at. And like, this is something I'm really good at. My family's really proud of me because I can do this. Did you feel that? Um, I definitely felt that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was a pretty confident kid. <laughs> and so... Um, You're a confident adult as well. Thank you. Well, as, a, as a kid. Yeah, definitely as a you kid. You had a sense... Yeah. Even before you were good... Even before I was playing good. playing the violin. Yes. I, you had confidence in what? Um, in my ability <clears throat> just to do something and do it really, really well, you know, it's not easy. So every time you sort of reach a new milestone, like right. playing Hot Cross Buns, that was profound, but it was even more profound when I got to 1812 Overture. Um, and so it sort of, it challenges you in all of these ways. And it's kind of like, I compare it for some people to being like a marathoner. It's like you're always trying to best yourself. Um, but your at personal the, best. Your personal best. <clears throat> um, but then in the space of the orchestra or the band, you also have these teammates you can kind of lean on and you're part of this community. Um, one of my great experiences as a young person was in the New Jersey Intergenerational Orchestra, which is a multi-generational ensemble. It still exists. It's uh, based, I think, in Berkeley Heights, um, founded by a music teacher many years ago back in the 90s in Cranford, um, where she was teaching. And so my stand partner was like a senior citizen <laughs> and became a mentor to me. Um, and so I got all these really positive experiences from people who had completely different life experiences from me, um, who challenged me in different ways. I got to um, perform at Lincoln Center. I got to perform in all these venues, go play for Congress, play for the United Would Nations. Would not have happened otherwise. Would not have happened otherwise. Well, I mean, I'm curious about this. You grew up in West Orange. For a kid in Newark, do you think it's even more important for a kid in a, in a particularly challenged community from a socioeconomic point of view? Absolutely. So? Um, and there's data for that as well, too. So Catterall 2012, which is um, an NEA-funded study, um, looked at a lot of other different studies that evaluated the impact of arts education on young people. Um, and what it found was not only does it have an, an impact on all young people, but it has an even greater impact in communities of need. So where there's lower income, more violence, um, you know, the sort of challenges that exist within often our urban communities here in New Jersey. Um, kids tended to have higher GPAs, better attendance rates. They were more civically wow. engaged. Um, and so it definitely has an impact on all young people, but an even stronger impact on young people in a community you love like what you York. do. I absolutely love what I do. It shows. Thank you. I'm looking forward to you, you joining us in the forum. Absolutely. Lauren Mann, Director, Newark Arts Education Roundtable. Well done. Thank you. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Please do welcome Amy Burns, music teacher, Far Hills, Country Day School and Chair of the NJMEA, which stands for? New Jersey Music Educators Association. Yes, the Early Childhood Music Education. Um, listen, we were just talking before we got in the air. You've been teaching music for 23 years. Yes. When did you know you wanted to do this? Uh, way back when I was about 14, 15 years old. I loved my um, high school 
And uh, I went to West Morris Bendham High School, so I loved the music program there. And they just sparked an interest in me, so I really started to study the clarinet specifically. I had already studied piano, thanks to my mother. And um, I knew I wanted to play music. And then my church had me also teaching early childhood Sunday school. So I knew right then and there I was going to be a music educator. Now, the, you're teaching children in pre-K, excuse me, pre-K up to fourth grade? I teach personally pre-K to fourth grade at my school. It goes pre-K to eighth grade at Far Hills, and I also do a waddler and a toddler program once oh. a month. <laughs> yes, a music, a mommy and music, mommy and right? me, yeah, caregiver and me. I want to give back to the community that I grew up in. So once a month, I do a free class, a music class for waddlers, six to 18 months, and then toddlers, 18 to three By the way, how, uh, you were just talking before we got in here about our initiative right from the start, NJ, which the so, website will go up as we speak right now. Yes. Again, and we just had this conversation previously with one of your colleagues, why is what you're talking about right now connected to right from the start, NJ? Well, as you know from the panel, you did a great three-part panel with the experts, and they drove home the fact. Dealing with birth to three. Yes, zero to three. And one of the facts on there was that by three years old, 80% of the brain is developed. And as they were pointing out, first comes the sound, then the language, then the vocabulary. So when your children are born, they're constantly listening to everything. And there are studies, like the um, Brain and Creativity Institute in Southern California did a study where they were, children were exposed to music and accelerated their brain development in speech and sound and language and reading skills. And this is because the auditory sensory that's where those are coming from. So it's really important, and I feel very passionate. So I was very thankful that Far Hills supported me three years ago when I asked them if we could start this community program and have a mommy and me, caregiver and me music class. But, Amy, you go even further than that. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the importance of exposing um, children who are not in this world yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> in a prenatal situation to music. Mm -hmm. Well, Talk about that. Well, Zoltan, Zoltan Kodai, who is a Hungarian ethnomusicologist. You think I didn't know that? <laughs> I did not. No, I did not. No, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm joking. I did no, not. but here's a great quote, which is, a child's music education begins nine months before not in their womb, but their mother's womb. Really? Yeah, so like, you are exposed to music. One of the best things that I can tell a parent to do is yes, go to these classes that are given by you know approaches from Dr. Fire Robin to music together. These are great classes, but the best thing you can do from zero to three is sing to your child. And a lot of the parents will look at me like, I can't sing, people told me mm. I can't sing. And I always apologize on behalf of anyone who said that to a parent because you can sing, and your child from zero to three love you unconditionally. What's the, payoff? Uh, the payoff is that they are going to be, uh, be absorbed in music, and they're going to be absorbed in language, and they're going to be absorbed in um, just learning more about their parent in that respect, and what they love, and what they consider great music for them. And it's really just a great, it pays off in so many benefits, from reading, to speech, to sound, to language, mm. to vocabulary. You, you've said that musical aptitude peaks at seven? Yes, Dr. Fire Robin, Dr. John Fire Robin, and um, also uh, Dr. Edwin Gordon, they have the, the, Dr. Edwin Gordon has the aptitude test and said it peaked around nine. Dr. Fire Robin believes it peaks around seven. And it is all that exposure to music. But as your panelists said, if they're not being exposed to music by age three. On the three, right from the start of yes, the series. Yes, the, if they're not being exposed to music by age three, then the neurons in their brain synapses are starting to die off. Really? Yeah. So, like, if you're not if you're not exposing your child to this music, then it just starts to die. So it's not too soon. Someone says, "Oh, it's too soon." No, not to expose them to music, not to have them listening, not to singing to them. No, always do that. Always. Oh, 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 help me understand something. But mm -hmm. aptitude, it's not the same as musical achievement. Right. A musical achievement, you're talking about in the moment, like winning a contest or getting first chair or auditioning. Situation. Yes. What's aptitude? Aptitude is that whole span of your lifetime of music and how it can further you in your future. It's really just constantly building and building and what you're learning and taking with you through every musical I'm, case. I'm curious about something. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about this. You're part of a larger discussion mm -hmm. we're having with the panel. Technology. Mm -hmm. To what degree has it influenced how you teach 
music to students pre-K to fourth grade? It's very interesting. So technology has, you always read the articles where you don't get put the screen time in front of your children. And we're talking about passive technology. So when I'm talking about technology, I'm talking about educational technology. So for pre-K, no, I'm not using a lot of technology. They should be touching those instruments right. and feeling them and exposed to them like that and, and experiencing them. But what technology can do in a classroom of pre-K through four is it can do things that you couldn't previously do with technology. For example, we use a digital learning portfolio. So yesterday, my second, what? a digital learning portfolio called Seesaw. So um, yesterday, my second graders mastered reading and playing this melody on xylophones. I mean, they were fantastic. So I took a video and put it on this, their Seesaw journal. It pings to the parents' phones, and now my music classroom is on their mobile device. That's fabulous. I also can, through technology, share music to people in other states. Is that the global thing? Yeah, other Explain countries. That. Yeah, so through things like Seesaw, Soundtrap, I can share music that the students create in my classroom with other students around this country, around other countries, and Why they is can that important? connect. It's really important for their education because Number one, technology is not going anywhere. <laughs> Number two, the global relations that children can make now will be with them forever. And who knows where they're going to end up? Who knows where they're going to live? And if they're starting to understand that their musical world is not here in this state, in this town, but goes well beyond. I'm curious about something before I let you go. Yeah. Your passion clearly comes through. People watching right now, they feel it, they see it, Thank sense you. it. 23 years at this. Just as strong, if not stronger? Stronger. I because? love I love what I do. <laughs> Some says, oh, burnout, you say? No. I ask teachers this all the time. I'm fascinated. No, by this. but I mean where I work, Far Hills is extraordinary because they're so um, they're so supportive of the arts, but they're also supportive of academics, and I think they have a great balance in their program. So I mean, until they kind of say, "Okay, Amy, you're done," <laughs> like, you're not even like close. here she comes again. No, I'm not even close. Um, hopefully, they'll always ask me back every year because I love what I do. I love teaching there, and music is so important. It's so important. It's what for me maybe mm -hmm. get through school um, because my progress reports constantly said Amy doesn't talk, but my music progress report wow. said Amy is the loudest singer in the classroom. <laughs> and so I, I'm very appreciative that music yes. is in our schools because it reaches children that academics don't always reach. Amy, thank you so much. Thank we'll you. look forward to having you in a larger discussion with your colleagues. Thank you so much. Good job. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. We're pleased to be joined by uh, Matt Ross, founder, One River School of Art and Design. Good to see you, Matt. Nice to see you. Describe your organization. Yeah, so we're, we're different. We are an art school that really teaches through the lens of living artists. We're trying to create uh, experiences that really celebrate the art of today mm. through a method and a process that we created, wrote, and have now been executing over six plus years. We're in nine locations in five states. And we've got an ambitious plan to grow and bring arts to communities around America. You know, you were talking right before we got in there, you have a background in broadcasting yeah. for about 20 years. You said yes. you were the general manager of a significant yes. radio station in this market. Yes. Um, what made you think that there was, there? I use the term again, a market for yeah. what you're doing? So it's interesting, there's a stepping stone. So in 2005, I've left, I left radio broadcasting for 20 years and went to invest in and be the CEO of the School of Rock, which is That's, a yeah. national network of music yeah, we've schools. we've done features on it. Yeah, and I built that business from about five to 55 schools in four years and um, recession hit. We wound up bringing on an institutional investor. I stayed on for a year and left. When I left in 2010, I sort of stepped back and said, go back to work for corporate America and commute uh -uh. or build on what I've been doing. And I really had this inquisitiveness and curiosity about um, childhood and adolescent development. And I really was intrigued by visual arts and contemporary art, and I wanted to explore it. So I got my 10,000 hours in about 18 months of self-discovery and education and went to work building a business plan. I'm curious about this. Arts education, you'll be part of a larger discussion we have on this subject uh, with, with three other colleagues. Yep. When it comes to arts education, why are we so far behind? I don't know that anyone is ahead of the curve. 
I mean? So I think we beat ourselves up a lot. You know, um, arts is always the stepchild. We, it doesn't get funding, doesn't get funding. The fact is, is we live in a world where most people think through the practical lens and they think through the vocational lens. And they have led, been led to believe, because we were raised this way, that there's a struggling artist potential in our kids, and we don't want that for them. What happens is it becomes a case of arrested sort of development in the sense that we don't nurture their sort of creative thinking and spatial thinking and abstract thinking to its maximum potential because we fear it might get in the way of them having a practical plan. This is my own sociological sort of analysis right. of this. I believe that for people to be fully developed, they really need to invest in themselves and their full potential. And it's great if you've got math and science skills. But you know, Columbia now at the med program teaches drawing in their medical program because it uh, helps the mind grow and think differently and allows you to deploy different thinking that solves problems. So I wholeheartedly believe that. I've watched thousands and thousands of kids grow up through the School of Rock, which is a business I ran, and now through One River School. And I see this sense of curiosity and development that happens organically through play first, and then practice, and then having fun through it, and getting better at it. And then you apply yourself more so. You know, it's interesting as I'm listening to you. Um, your success, it seems to me, is a product of your passion for what you do, yep. an entrepreneurial, an intense, yes. uh, unabiding entrepreneurial spirit, yes. a tenacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So here's what I'm curious about. When it comes to music, the arts, to what degree can you teach, dare I call it, this yeah. intense entrepreneurial spirit that some of us who, you know, I'm not, it's not about me or anything, but what we do today is a product of just that, yes. 20, between 25 and 30 years ago, we decided to do this, to create this, to go out and raise the money sure. for it, to build sure. a team, to do, and every day it's a challenge and it's exciting, but what I'm trying to get at is there are people who are artists who very often don't have that skill set and are looking for someone else to somehow set them up? Am I making too much of this? Yeah, no, so I think there's a couple things that I'm hearing. One is this notion of how do you sort of activate your most entrepreneurial skill set. Yeah. Um, and be your own best advocate. Yeah, and artists need that. And I think there is a coaching model for them. I think some get it really well on their own. Um, but I can make you a, a um, sprinter if you're not a sprinter. So in other words, if you're a one in sprinting, maybe I can get you to a four, but maybe there's other skills that you have that allow you to sort of facilitate your growth. I kind of think of all of us as having a sort of broad spectrum of skills, but we've got core strengths. Right. And I, this is sort of, um, Don Clifton started this through the Gallup uh, sort of evaluation of people's strengths and traits, and I believe in that. So inevitably, the most important thing is finding out who you are, what you do best, and spending most of the time accelerating those things that you do best, building compensatory skills for the things so you do well. Do the arts help you do that? I think they do in so many ways because, you know, there's just pure problem solving mm -hmm. in art making constantly. Iterative, for example? Iterative, iterative thinking. So you start a painting with a blank canvas. Most, some artists have a drawing that is, in essence, the preparatory work for a painting. So they've gone through this process to sort of prepare a plan to produce something that is a more finished version of it. Other folks go, nope, I just step to the canvas and I improvise, right? Now, I can't tell you to improvise if you're a planner, a focused, thoughtful, strategic thinking artist. Um, but you might get better if you challenge yourselves with drills that might actually just be free form art making. Mm. So I think there's so many different ways that the so the creative brain ultimately gets um, at its own sort of pure potential, but this brain that can be developed through art making from the early stages mm. through adulthood serves you in life. It serves you in problem solving, relationship building, and all sorts of things. Matt, before I let you out here, some yep. of the exhibits that we can expect from your operation? Yeah, so we do exhibitions from emerging artists in our five schools right now. We've got a guy named Jesse Greenberg who curated emerging artists. I'm glad you asked about that. We show working living artists who are showing around the world in our schools. And we think it's important for people to walk in off the street in Allendale or Milburn or you know, Westchester or Why do they or need to see that? Because they have no sense of relevance. So, so. I go in the city, the city, Philadelphia, New York yes, City, Yes, how whatever. often? 
How right. often does it happen? Because we live in a world of our own necessary tasks on a daily, weekly basis. We don't have ex excess time. And in suburbia where we are, we're often raising kids and we're married to their calendar and, and clock. And why should that be mutually exclusive with appreciation for the arts? It, it, should. sh it shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be. And mostly what people think of as art making is the art of yesterday. So we wrote a curriculum and a methodology that celebrates the art of today. And we teach that in our, in our lesson plans. And we try to create more appreciation for living artists because there's two million of them in America. One to ten, uh, how much you love what you do? <laughs> 10.5. Easier just, more than 10. Yeah, no question. Matt Ross. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. you joining us and, and be part of our larger discussion. And folks who go on our website, steveautobato.org, you can check it out if you haven't uh, seen it on television. Thank Thanks, you, my Steve. friend. Appreciate it. Well done. Stay my right pleasure. There. Thanks. Sure. Check out next time, folks. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by... The PNC Foundation, the Turrell Fund, supporting Right from the Start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the New Jersey Education Association, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, the Northward Center, and by Georgian Court University. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. When it comes to you and your family's health care, transparency is key. At Holy Name Medical Center, we believe in creating an environment where patients can be educated and informed so they can get the most out of their health care. As New Jersey's health care industry continues to evolve and change, Holy Name remains committed to providing patients with high quality, accessible, and affordable health care.